for this computer. Um, so I have started recording. I should have said that at the beginning. And this will be available for future uh, viewing uh, and for others that were not able to join us. Uh, as I said, uh, Dr. Tony Prescatori will be talking about raising egg production pullets. And with the COVID-19 outbreak, there has been an uptake in people wanting to raise chickens in the backyard for egg production. So it's a very timely topic. Uh, if you have any questions during his um, presentation, whoops, I hit the wrong thing. Um, you can either uh, type it in the Q&A box or you can type it in the chat. I will be monitoring both. If a question comes up that is pertinent to what uh, Dr. Pescatori is talking about at the time, I will pop up. Uh, I will be muted until then and I will pop up and ask the question. If the question is not specifically related to uh, what he's talking about at that moment, I will hold the question and will ask questions at the uh, end of the presentation. So you can either do it in the Q&A box or you can do it in the chat box. And while uh, Dr. Pescatori is presenting, I will be on mute and I will be monitoring the questions. So thank you very much for joining us and thank you Dr. Pescatori for being available to do this presentation. I will go in onto mute and uh, let you um, give your presentation. Well, as Jackie said, this is kind of a timely topic because uh, I've seen three or four news stories now about the increase in the desire to people to have either backyard flocks or small flocks because there, at some point there was an egg shortage and there was a, a empty egg case in the store, so people are thinking they want to get into ch uh, chickens. I hope a lot of they they can't keep them stock in our feed supply stores or our uh, rural supply or tractor supply. And I also noticed the online uh, hatcheries have increased the price of the chickens already. So uh, we're uh, I, it, it is the poultry's version of toilet paper. But I, with that, uh, raising egg production pullets has always been a an issue, whether it's for the small producer or for a, the, the medium producers. I think that's one of the areas that keeps on growing is that people got into the egg business and they keep adding to that medium sized farm and they're having a, a very hard time getting pullets. So what I wanna talk about today is just how we raise pullets, some of the basics that are there. And I kind of made it that it was like, here's the steps to it. Uh, we do have a publication on our web page that's about uh, raising pullets if you want more information. But uh, we're trying to make sure that you understand what needs to be done. And as I said that there was a big, we, we are a large consumer eggs. We're eating about 280 eggs per person. And when the supply was shortaged, everybody was thinking about it. And there's a movement towards different types of uh, production systems. So there is an interest in, uh, in egg production. And with that, having laying hens, whether what scale uh, varies to people. So what is a pullet? And this is where uh, it becomes a real uh, uh, definition. And, in government, the true definition is a laying hen under one year of age. But in the industry and in common uh, discussions, we don't use that definition anymore. When we talk about a pullet, we're talking about a replacement hen prior to the onset of lay, somewhere around 20 weeks of age. So when I talk about a pullet, I'm talking about that replacement hen just before she starts egg production. And whatever becomes of uh, product, producing uh, pullets, why do you want to raise chickens? And why do you want to raise laying hens? Do you, 
well, you know, do you want to have a layer flock that is commercial size that you're going to sell eggs from? Is it a flock that you're going to use for personal use? That's one of the things you first have to uh, come up with as you start planning to raise some pullets. Uh, you may also want to sell ready to lay uh, hens. We have a gentleman here in uh, Lexington that's made a nice little uh, niche market for himself. He will start laying hens and get uh, laying hen pullets up to a certain age and then sell them to uh, many of our urban poultry uh, producers. Or do you want to have it as a hobby flock? Uh, is it something for uh, the backyard? Is it something that you want the eggs? Oh, or you may not even be sure why you want uh, to raise pullets, or it can be a combination of all these reasons. Whatever it is, it's we're, we're trying to raise the best bird because those birds stay around for a long time. So to put it basically what our goals are for raising pullets, we're trying to lay, raise laying hens. And those hens need to be healthy, they need to be well fed, they need to be uh, at their target body weight, they need to be ready for photostimulation, and their target body weight is for the desired egg size. So our goals of raising pullets are to meet the needs of the bird and get it to the point where she can uh, achieve her genetic potential and she's ready to be a productive hen in the laying house. And when we raise pullets, there's some th rules in nature that we can't uh, get around. One is light starts, stops, and controls egg production. If we're going to raise an animal for egg production, we have to take into consideration how light is going to affect that animal. So that's the first rule of nature we can't go around. Second is that body weight is related to egg size. The animal has to, the bird has to be to a certain body weight in order to come into uh, egg size and to maintain that egg size. The birds also need a calcium reserve. The skeleton is being of that to make uh, egg shells. The chicks are precocious animals. They need heat the first three weeks. Uh, another thing of nature is that the hens reach their mature body weight at the same time they're reaching peak egg production. So that's a large demand that's on that bird as she's trying to uh, maintain her mature body weight. And then the last one is a poor quality pullet is with you for over a year or more. So if you do a bad job raising the pullet, it is something, it's a gift that keeps on giving. So those are our nature's rules. So when we design a management system or we're trying to raise birds, we can't get around those six rules or five rules. We need to make sure we understand that these things aren't going to change. So then it comes up to the point, what do we want? Now we have to start asking ourselves, do we want a brown egg layer? Do we want a white egg layer? Do we want a pastel uh, producing uh, bird? Do we want a brown egg layer, uh, red feathers, white feathers? What do we want in those birds? Those are sort of types of things you first have to get into your personal preference and deciding which one of those birds you want and what you're trying to accomplish. If you're just uh, raising them for yourself, do you want an assortment of eggs? Do you want a, uh, a deep brown egg or a light brown egg? All those things are personal preferences. But when we look at those two uh, commercial strains, I put this up here is to give you some idea that 
when we raise pullets, we're really trying to reach the genetic potential of the bird. So here's two examples, a highline 36, which is a white egg layer, and highline brown, which is a brown egg layer. And when we start looking at what we want to accomplish, these are the goals that we should put into our uh, put in for ourselves. One, we should have livability of 97 or 98 percent. They're going to consume feed for a period of uh, anywhere from four to five months. During rearing, the white laying hens will eat between 11 and 12 pounds while the brown Bonnie, will eat, yes. I can't hear you, I don't know what happened. Okay. I don't know if it's just me or if it's everybody, but I can't hear you. Yeah. I, everybody else, else hears you just fine, so it must be my right, side. I, I will me? figure out uh, what my problem you. is. Go on. Okay, I'll go without the microphone. Uh, Feed consumption and rearing 11 to 12 pounds for the, the smaller white uh, bird, 12 to 13 pounds for the larger brown bird. That body weight is under three pounds for the white layers. It's slightly over three pounds when it goes into lay. The mature weights is about a pound difference between the white and the brown hen, but you're looking at an animal that's about 3.3 pounds versus 4.1 pounds. And they're gonna, they're, and when we start talking about these animals that we're raising, pig egg production should be at 95% or higher. So one of the things we need to make sure of is that when we're raising pullets, we have a reserve built into that bird. Days to 50% production is around 140 to 143 days. Feed consumption is one of the as th under 100 grams per bird per day, which is about two tenths of a pound, or uh, over uh, slightly over 100 grams for the brown. And the feed conversions are about 1.9 per pounds of feed per per pound of eggs, and we're looking at livability of about 96 percent. And egg mass per hen is 55 pounds and 56 pounds for the brown. So this is what we're trying to accomplish when we raise those birds, is can we produce this efficient animal that can achieve these things? So let's look at what really happens to the bird. On the green line is the bird's body weight. We have a growth curve that shows itself not reaching maximum body weight until that 32, 34 uh, weeks of age. We're gonna light them at uh, 16 or 17 weeks, or maybe slightly later, if that's your preference. So they're Tony, gonna be coming, yeah. Somebody has a question. What does peak egg production 95 to 96% mean? Is it related to weight, number of eggs? What is the percent in reference to? That is that on any given day at peak egg production, 95% of the hens will have laid an egg. Thank you. And that's what it looks like on hen day egg production. It, that's what that curve is. That means that about 95, if you had 100 hens, 95 of them will lay an egg that day. And they will hold up that production for quite a while, and then it will drop off to about 70%. At the same time, the body weight is increasing. We have that sharp rise in egg production, and we have uh, increasing average egg weight as the hen gets older. So if you look at that curve, when we're done raising a pullet, look at the demand that we're going to put on her from a uh, metabolic standpoint. We're gonna have her still growing her body, we're still going to be producing large volumes of eggs, and we're going to have her starting to put out even bigger eggs. So. That's what this, uh, a typical production curve looks like for a hen, a little, the average egg weight and the body weight. So those are what we're, we're asking the hen to do. 
So that's what we try to do when we raise pullets is to make that bird ready to do this. So if you're gonna get started raising birds, you need to start asking yourself some questions. The first one is how many hens do you want? Do you want, uh, here in Kentucky, where we cannot sell less than six, uh, six chicks together. So you're gonna have to have at least six hens uh, or six chickens when you buy your birds. And how, how many hens do you want? Related to that is how many eggs do you want? We just showed you the egg production curve. How many eggs do you want? If you have 100 hens or you have 50 hens and they're at 95% production, that means on every given day, you're gonna have 95 eggs. Yeah, so if you're going to have that, what is your market and what are you doing? Another question to ask yourself is what is your budget? What is your feed cost, your chick cost, your equipment cost, your shelter cost, all those things, and balance that with the income of the eggs and the spent fowl. This is one where people that buy, a, that are starting a small flock or just breaking into the, the uh, semi-commercial or moving towards the middle, the chick cost all becomes a major expense, but what really comes to a major expense is the feed cost. You have to remember that graph we just, or table we just showed you, they're going to eat 12 pounds of feed per bird before they give you the first day. So somebody's got to pay for that feed along the way. Other questions uh, as what kind of egg do you want is another one. Is it the shell color that's important to you? Are you planning on raising an organic? All those things pay, play into uh, how you get started in raising pullets. And then what kind of chicken do you want? Do you want a heritage breed? Do you want a commercial strain? Do you want a red or black sex link uh, a bird? What are you looking at? And to give you some idea, we did a study a few years ago where we took a, a commercial strain, the, uh -oh, which is the black line or the top line. That is the production we got out of a, of a, a Issa Brown, which is a commercial line, where you see that they uh, had a good egg production. They came into production fast and they came up to peak production and a, and a, and a good clip. The other lines are heritage birds. Those are birds that are either purebreds like a black Australop or barred Plymouth Rock or Rhode Island Red or the uh, black sex link or red sex link, which are types of layers you can buy at most hatcheries. But what you're seeing is, is that the commercial strains are selected for egg production. So they will peak at a higher percentage. They will maintain that egg production for a longer period of time, as opposed to what the birds that weren't as intensively uh, bred for egg production will do. Those birds will also give you smaller eggs. Egg size is something that the commercial strains are uh, selected for. So they come into egg size quicker and they maintain a larger egg as opposed to the, uh, other, uh, the other birds in this study. So that's something to consider as you move forward with trying to decide what type of pullet chick you want to get. So when you're ready and you've decided this is what you want to do, we want uh, you need to start thinking about where am I going to get them from? You need to identify a reliable source. A reliable source is one that's going to give you healthy chicks. They're going to give you the chicks on time. 
And if something happens to the chick during shipment, they will take responsibility for it. That's a reliable source. If you, they, they deliver when they, they say they're going to deliver and there's no problems with them and the birds are healthy, they have, they're, they're good looking chicks when they come here. One of the things we require in this state is that they're, national, they're, they're part of the National Poultry Improvement Plan, or NPIP. They are certified by their state uh, officials under a USDA program that they are looking for certain diseases. They could be looking, well, they have to be looking for Salmonella pylorum, and they test all their breeders for that. They have to look, they have to be uh, H5H7 clean hatchery in regards to avian influenza. And they may monitor for salmonella as well. So I recommend you go and you can get a list of hatcheries uh, off of the NPIP uh, site. And they'll tell you what states the people are in. And they even have a code that allows you to look up what kind of birds they have. But finding a reliable source is the first step you have to do. And one of the things that has been very good in the last couple of years is the uh, feed supply stores or the uh, uh, equipment supply stores have done a much better job of maintaining uh, the chicks on display, not having them in contact with other people, keeping them separated by shipments, all the things you'd expect in a reliable source. And they've done a much better job of doing that over the last three or four years. Now, if you're going to order pullets and raise pullets, you should order female chicks. It's very tempting not to do that if you're doing a heritage breed that's supposed to be a dual purpose. Dual purpose means that, that the males could be held for meat, but they're very inefficient. So you're better off uh, ordering female chicks. And at current prices, that'll cost you somewhere around 50 to 50 cents or a dollar per chick to get the female chick, but then you're getting what you want as opposed to straight run chicks, which means they haven't been sexed and you're getting males and females. As much as we, we do, uh, one of the things you got to remember is a male doesn't have to be present for a chicken to lay an egg. It needs to be present if you want the chicken to lay a fertile egg, but we don't need the males. Uh, it's much better to order all female chicks, and that way you can concentrate on raising them up. At the hatchery, I personally recommend that uh, producers buy the chicks uh, already beak trimmed. Uh, I, infrared is a method of, of trimming the beaks. When we talk about trimming the beaks, we're going to take just a little bit off the beak. It helps the bird because. It's less pointy as the beak is, and it's less sharp. It can do less damage to its neighbors, and it also improves their feed efficiency a little bit. But I will also recommend that the birds get vaccinated for Merrick's disease. It's one of the few diseases which I will uh, ask people to vaccinate their birds for, even if they haven't had a history on their farm. But Mer Merrick's disease is a disease in our state and in many places across the country. That's a very prevalent disease. And since you're keeping these birds a long time, you need to protect it against Merrick's disease. And if you're going to raise the birds on the floor and you want to use uh, limited medications, I would uh, recommend that you vaccinate for coccidiosis that's an option that you can do at the hatchery. So if you are hoarding the chicks, order all female chicks, make sure it's an MPIP hatchery, make sure you've infrared beak trimmed the birds, vaccinate for Merrick's disease and vaccinate for coccidiosis if you're gonna keep them outside or on the floor. 
Here's an example of what happens with infrared beak trimming. The infrared uh, will burn a spot uh, at the tip of the beak and that part will not grow anymore and will eventually fall off. And it does make a big difference uh, with uh, control of cannibalism and uh, feather picking. Beak trimming, uh, layer chicks are successfully beak trimmed at the hatchery, or it can be done, if you wanna do precision beak trimming, which is a more uh, traumatic or uh, injury prone uh, uh, beak trimming, that would be done at 10 days. It's not necessary to really uh, retrim at six weeks or 12 weeks of age if we do a good job with the infrared. Uh, if they have a lot of light coming in, uh, they may want to have a second beak trimming, but I would not recommend that. I would try to stay with my one beak trimming and it leaves the le less damaging to the other birds and less feed wastage. And here's an example of a trimmed and untrimmed bird. You can see the difference of how sharp the beak is in the one, in the one animal as opposed to the blunt uh, beak in the other. So now that we got chicks coming, we ordered them, we have to understand what's going to happen to these birds. And you're looking at an animal or a bird that you're going to raise for 16 to 20 weeks, depending what kind of schedule you're going to be on. And I like to break it down into phases. So the first four weeks, you're trying to get that bird off to a good start. So it's aptly named the starter phase. We're going to get that bird on feed, get them uh, accustomed to their environment. They're gonna get be eating and drinking and getting a good start. From four to 12 weeks, the bird is actually building its framework. It's growing, it's trying to uh, build its skeleton, and build its digestive, you know, uh, sure its digestive tract. That's the growth phase. And then from 12 to 15 weeks, we have the bird is now developing reserves trying to bring from the, the pullet house to the layer house a reserve of bodily uh, materials, such as calcium and skeleton, uh, a, some muscle mass and things like that, amply called the developer phase. And then 15 to 18 weeks of age, we're gonna be in the prelay phase. We're going to start worrying about making sure the bird is ready to produce eggs. So as we build a management system for raising pullets, we want to make sure we have those four phrases, uh, phases in, in our mind. Get them off to a good start, get them growing, develop their reserves, and then get them ready for lay. So let's start with the starter phase and brooding. Now, as we can, uh, we mentioned under the na the uh, the uh, nature's rules, a chicken is a, preco a, a precocious animal. <clears throat> it can get on along pretty good on its own, but we have to make sure that we're ready to take care of that animal. So before the chicks arrive, we want to pre-hit the uh, brooder house prior to chick placement. Uh, preheat it 24 hours if it's normal time. If you get weather like we're having right now and some other parts of the country is, it's kind of cold out there. You want to preheat uh, a few days uh, uh, ahead of time and get that temperature up. You want to fill the feed lines if you have automatic or even if you have uh, manual, adjust the feeders ready for it. Uh, have access to the line for the first day. Uh, make sure that there's bright lights. We're talking 
30 to 50 lux during the zero to seven days. This helps the, the chick get on feed and water and adapt to their new environment. So they're trying to get set up and they get good feed results. Here's a typical broil of the typical brooder uh, system. We have a uh, guard ring around these particular birds. We have waters placed around the outside. We have feed feeders uh, and waters, so the birds have access to both. And then we this is a a zone heating where you can see the canopy heat uh, brooder in the center. This happens to be a, uh, a gas one, but you can then use infrared lights or whatever. But we're really trying to warm up the area where the birds are. Got a question, Tony? Uh, is brooder lighting 24 hours during zero to seven days? Is brooder lighting? Yes, we're going to, that's one of the disadvantages of brooding, uh, using a heat lamp. They're going to be on 24 hours of light. And most times people like to give us some period of darkness in case there's a power failure. You don't get that operation with uh, brooder lights because they're on the whole time. What about the red lamps? The red lamps, they still perceive red. It's not as, it doesn't impact them as much as, as the white lights. Okay. But here's a nice setup for raising the pullets. And we always want to make sure that when we brood birds together, they're always of similar age uh, themselves and they come out of the same breeder flocks. You wouldn't want to try to brood bantams and, and standard breeds together because you then have uh, discrepancies in the size. <clears throat> you need to modify temperature as needed to meet the bird's comfort needs. And we can adjust the temperature depending on humidity. The lower temperatures can be used in high humidity. Here's an example of a brooder light in the center. If you notice the one on the far uh, left, you'll see that the, the birds are spread out evenly, they're comfortable, they're moving in and out. And that's one of the most important things you can do when you're setting up a brooder system for with their, any birds you're using, is giving the birds the opportunity to move to the heat and to move away from the heat. You might find somebody that's doing a small number of birds that would like to put a brooder lamp over a plastic tub and think they're doing good and they have the chickens on slow roast. So we want to make sure that the bird has the opportunity to move to or away from the heat source. Here's an example in uh, the first center picture where the birds are all cuddled together or huddled together in the center. That is an indication that the that's too cold. Remember, we're talking about the, the, the height of the bird is about three inches. That's the temperature where we, we're worried about. We don't care if you're comfortable, we want to worry about the bird's comfort. That's an example of it being too hot, uh, too cold. The one next to it where everybody's walking away from the heat is too hot. And then on the final one on the right side, you have the, the uh, birds being spread, spread to one side, which is a good indication that there's some type of draft or cold spot in that brooding area. One of the things we want to do that first three days is encourage consumption. And one of the things we can do is we can place feed on paper uh, and and uh, along with the, near the permanent feeder to train the chicks to move towards the feeder, or we can use a separate chick feeder that we can get the chicks to find the feed easier. <clears throat> if we use paper, we want to make sure it's a textured paper, that's an embossed paper, nothing slick, nothing uh, slippery, because we don't want to cause leg problems with the animal later on. Uh, after seven to 14 days of age, they can, they can remove the paper, usually about seven days, 
and take that out of there, but it gets the birds off to a good start. Here's an example of a chick feeder where you have the birds moving in there, they find the feed. It, uh, you can uh, put a little piece of paper down below it, put feed, spill feed onto there, and you'll get a good start on the chick. Because we wanna get them on feed and water as soon as possible, because that's what we're trying to, that's a key to their survival. One of the things we also do as we're putting in those chicks, one of the things we like to do is, is this is the time to look at the animals and see whether or not its navel area around its stomach is healed, if it's dehydrated, if it's been in transit for a long time. If you know you notice that some birds are having problems, you may need to set up a hospital pen and increase the attention you give those birds by getting them on more, uh, get them on feed and getting them on water. And brood management, you know, we one of the things we look at is temperature. That bird is coming in there with its body temperature about that chick is 104 degrees. Doesn't have a good regulation of its body temperature at. That's why we have to add supplemental heat. And we also have a relationship to, to humidity. Anytime the humidity is uh, over 60%, we can reduce the brooding temperature by two, per, two uh, degrees Fahrenheit. And our whole goal is to start out very high, but we're gonna reduce it about five degrees weekly until we reach about 70 degrees. The other thing is when you're flushing water lines or changing water, especially if you're getting them chicks early in the season and it's cold, you wanna make sure that water is tempered before you give it to the chicks. You don't wanna give them uh, uh, cold water or that's just coming out of the faucets because that'll, that interferes with their ability to regulate their body temperature. Depending on the type of drinking system that you use, you'll, you'll need to have it at the right height. If you're using a nipple system, whether it's a commercial nipple system or it's a nipple that's in the bottom of a uh, water bucket, the nipple, it sh said, should be level with the chick's head. We want them to reach above their uh, head to hit the nipple and see it and get that water. This is this is a preferred body of, of drinking system because in reality, when you look at how a bird drinks, they drink by tipping their head out. This is a more natural uh, drinking behavior for the chick as it's getting started. If you're using a watering system that is level or that has water in the reserve, whether it's a cup or it's a uh, gallon jug uh, of chicken water, we wanna make sure that the birds can reach down, get the water and come back. For cups, you want it level with the chick's back. You would probably want the same thing with the uh, gallon water jugs. The less, uh, the higher the water is, especially for uh, bell drinkers or if you have the gallon waters, if you get that off the litter, the water stays cleaner and the chicks don't have to reach as far to get water. Here's an example of what we recommend that you do with the new chicks. When the new chicks are in, we want to teach the chick where the water is and have them drink, whether it's a gallon water or a nipple water, we wanna make sure that they see where the water is and they got a drink of water. So we try to dip the beaks of every chick we start. And especially if you're raising large number of chicks, one of the things that you need to do is a technique called crop fill. That's where you, after, uh, 12 or 24 hours, you look at the chicks and see if there's feed in the crop. 
The crop is an outpocketing or a little pouch that's outside the bird's body cavity at the base of its neck. And if it's got feed and they've gone on feed, you will feel feed in that area. And we'd like to see within 24 hours, 100% of the birds have feed in the crop. So that's one of the things we want to look at is this is a good measure whether or not the chicks got off to a good start. It's one of those things that if a chick hasn't picked up feed, if you catch it within 24 hours, you can set up a nursery pen. You can spend time trying to get that bird to drink because a lot of times the lack of feed consumption is directly tied to the uh, lack of drinking. And without the drinking behavior, she's, they're not going to make it much past three days. So when we start thinking about our chick and what's going to happen to her, she's going to start growing. And you can see the various phases in the first 42 days of life of that chick. The first thing we want is we're going to, with, these, with a commercial strain and even some of the <clears throat> uh, heritage strains, the chick is not near, the layer chick is not as aggressive as it once was. As they tried to calm down the bird to prevent cannibalism and feather pecking, they made a calmer bird, but it's a less aggressive bird, not only to each other, but also to find feed. So one of the things that the commercial people are now recommending is to have extreme hot temperatures at the first three days. So we're talking about somewhere in the low 90s to get those chicks started. And you, I, I thought that would be a little excessive, but in my own experience raising pullets is that once you get into that higher uh, temperature, you get the chicks having a uh, much better performance. They get thirsty and they start looking for water. During that first uh, few days, we're going to be in that high temperature. Our light intensity is going to be of 30 to 50 lux. Uh, 50 lux is about four foot candles. We want bright light. We want the chicks to find the feed in the water. And we're either on a 22 hour or we're on an intermittent lighting protocol. 22 hours is probably what we want. That way we, the birds have accustomed to a period of darkness. So if the power gets out or goes out, they don't pile or try to uh, smother each other. From that point on, we can see we're gonna lower temperature. We're going to uh, keep the luck, the light intensity same, but we start backing off the light. So every four days, we're starting to take an hour away from the birds. Because one of the goals that we have is we got to get the bird ready for stimulatory light. So you can see the temperatures are going down. And those first three to four weeks, that hen, needs, that hen needs to have supplemental heat. They still need to keep, a, 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 as she replaces her, her down with feathers, she needs a little less heat. And our light intensity is starting to be cut in half. And the hours, we're going to lose about uh, an hour each week as we move forward. So that when we're ready out of this, uh, after we've gone from the starter into the developer, we're at that 70 degrees temperature. We're at very low, uh, one can, a foot candle or lower. One of the things we have found that if you want to control cannibalism, control the light intensity, the birds will still eat, but they aren't as aggressive to each other. And we're down to about 16 hours of light. Light is very important because that's what's gonna turn the bird's reproductive tract on to produce eggs. 
So when we're raising replacement pullets, we focus on the pullet rearing programs to optimize growth and development. And the reason for that is the best predictor of layer performance is the body weight and the body type of the layer as it enters the point of lay. Does she have good fleshing? Does she have slight uh, fat reserve? Does she have a good body weight and a good form of their skeleton? That's the best predictor. So when we're feeding pullets, we're trying to optimize growth and development. That pullet flock, when it uh, and the, uh, the pullet flock entering production at the crate body weight will have the best uh, uh, the best production. And one of the other things besides the birds being individuals, we try to have the flock uniform. We want anywhere from 85 to 90 percent uniformity in the flock as it goes into lay. So some of the things we worry about or key points is one is in that first seven days, the chick's body weight has to double. So from the time it arrives to the time it's one week old, their body weight doubles. So if they're coming in with the 50 or 60 gram chick, they want 120 grams by the end of, uh, 100 grams by the end of the week. And there are key points that we worry about. If you're looking at when are the most important things, 6, 12, 18, 24, and 30, we're on a six-week schedule there. Those are points where you can look at targets and say, is the bird developing? And we're, uh, we're not so worried about exceeding the pullet's body weight standards during the rearing phase as say a broiler breeder producer is. Because that bird has been selected for small body size, most laying hens are of small body size, we can afford to put a little more size into that bird and not have any damage later on when she's producing eggs. Some of the things we look at from three weeks of age, you could put about you can put about birds at a half a square foot or two birds per square foot. If you're using a nipple system, one to twelve birds, and we like at least two inches per bird uh, of, of feeder space. As we get older, we want three inches and then four inches of feeder space. We reduce the number of of uh, birds per nipple from one to eight to one to six and then we start doubling the foods of the the square footage per bird so one square foot uh by 15 weeks uh comfortably in a laying hen if it's not a commercial operation two square feet would be ad adequate my own rule of thumb is because there's so many triggers in a laying house with the lights coming on or the caretaker showing up, the birds will imprint on certain triggers, stimulating them to eat. So one of the things that I always say is, every bird should have the ability to eat at the same time. So that requires a little more feeder space it solves a lot of problems with cannibalism, feather pecking, or uh, dermatitis uh, scratches in the birds. So having a little extra feeder space is not the worst thing you can do. Included here is a typical uh, growth curve and uh, consumption curve for a brown egg layer. Cumulatively, we're looking about 2% mortality over 17 weeks. We have a body weight of little excess of three pounds, three and a half pounds. That bird is going to eat about 80 grams per day. 
And the important thing is we get down to 11 or 12 to 13 pounds of cumulative feed intake. And that's one of the mistakes I think people make is when they're feeding these birds and you go to buy feed and you haven't thought this through, you see the $10 bag of chicken feed and you see the $4 bag of cracked corn and you know chickens eat cracked corn, so you try to cut your feed with cracked corn. Plan on knowing that you're gonna buy 12 pounds of feed in that 17 weeks. And then the other thing too is the birds drink as much water as they eat feed. So if they they if they eat a pound a uh, a tenth of a pound a two tenths of a pound of feed they drink two tenths of a pound of water, so they're going to be eating uh, drinking a hundred and twenty uh, milliliters of water a day. So plan on that, and particularly when you're starting out. So here's the life cycle of the bird in the pullet house and into going into lay. And these are the events that are occurring to that bird as we raise her. We look at that chicken from the outside and there's lots of things that are happening to her on the inside. And there's lots of demands on her as she's developing. So if you think about the first Four, three to four weeks of age, they're going, to, they're going to get rid of their down feathers, put their first set of feathers on them. That's occurring before five weeks age. At the same time, she's starting to develop her skeleton. So she's got skeletal growth that's occurring, trying to develop her, uh, her, her skeleton. But more importantly, as that bird is going on feed, and as she's sitting there being exposed to the environment, that bird is building its immune system up and it's also building its digestive system. So that's what's happening to that poor bird is all those demands are on there. And she's just starting to get things there. By 10 weeks, she's molted her sec first set of feathers again and putting on her juvenile feathers. She's also at this point building muscle for her, uh, the, the little bit of muscle that she has on her breast and her legs. She's starting to develop, put muscles in there. The skeleton has continued to grow. By about 13 weeks, the frame of the skeleton is there. So we have that short three month period to get the skeleton in there. She's starting to have her, her immune system built, her muscles to be built. When we get to about 15 uh, weeks of age, we're going to start lighting the bird. We're starting to stimulate, uh, uh, give her stimulatory light. And at that point, her uh, ovaries and reproductive tract is occurring. She's putting on some body fat and she's building a, the medullary bone that is part of her skeleton system that uh, is a reserve that's in the hollow points of all areas of her bone that acts as a reserve for calcium as she lays eggs. And she's not gonna reach physical uh, maturity until about 30 weeks of age. Here's the diets that we would recommend. Uh, if you're just going to a local feed store, you're going to see a starter grower. You're going to see maybe a developer uh, and a layer. But the things to remember is we, we can start out with a lower protein than we would for a meat bird, about 17, 18%. Move on down. Coming into lay, we'd be about 16, 15%. But it's got to be high quality protein. So there are requirements for amino acids. There's low calcium in the diets until she has her pre-lay diet. And then our lay diet is going to be about 3.5% protein, uh, uh, 3.5% calcium or higher. 
So just an example of the diets, the starter growers are going to have a, a medium energy. They're gonna have a, an, about a, a, the high mid uh, percent protein. And we're talking about getting down into uh, the calcium being the most important thing. And then stimulatory light. Uh, in a closed system where you control the lighting, we can step down the lights through uh, 12 weeks of age, 13 weeks of age, and then bring the lights back up and get stimulatory results. And we want to get to about uh, 16 hours of light to get it stimulatory. In an open system, we have to play with nature. Whenever you get your chicks, you need to figure out for your latitude and longitude what time the sun sets, what time the sun rises. And that total duration of sunlight is what we need to do in order to uh, light the birds. So here's an example. In mid-June, we're going to have the longest time of day of the year, and we have to plan around it. So what we have here is if you look at the 17 weeks of age, this was a flock that uh, we started. Uh, and what we have to do is we have to keep the light constant. So we had to, re and the red is the artificial light that we're adding to that natural day length in order to uh, keep the birds on non slimatory light. So here they're at 12, 13, 14% light, 14 hours of light. They're held on it constantly so they don't have any stimulation. Then when we're ready to light them, we give them increasing light until uh, we get to stimulatory light of 16 hours. And that amount of light increases as the day length gets shorter. Open systems are much more, hard, uh, much more difficult to control lighting. One of the other things is if you're going to have perches for the hens, you want to make sure uh, you have perches in the pullet so they learn it. Uh, these are the requirements for a laying hen perch, six inches of perch space per bird. Obviously, you can have that. And then you want varying heights. Uh, 16 inches is probably your highest, and you want to be uh, maybe eight inches at the lower. You want them a foot apart so the birds can get on and you wanna make sure the birds on the perch are not aimed at the feeders and the waters. Because we're gonna keep these birds for as long as we are, our biosecurity plan starts with the chicks themselves. We want a reliable source of birds, an MPIP hatchery. We do not wanna mix ages. We want a closed flock except for chicks or hatching eggs coming in. When you do your daily chores, we wanna work from the young birds to the older birds. The young birds are naive in their immune system. The older birds may be carriers or have uh, less chance of showing signs of a disease. We bring in adult birds, which we don't recommend, but if you do bring in other birds, 30 days of isolation of the new birds. And it's always a good idea to have designated clothing and boots for your operation. Limit the amount of shared equipment you have between different people, and then also limit your visitors. Remember, you're going to keep this bird for over a year. Anything you do that compromises its health will carry forward. Vaccination and health. As I stated before, vaccinate for Merrick's disease at the hatchery. Vaccinate for coccidiosis at the hatchery, if at all possible. Do not vaccinate for any other diseases unless the disease has a history on your farm or in the area. Unless there is a disease, you will do more damage trying to vaccinate for something that you don't need to than if you just wait to see if it's necessary. And one of the other things is never vaccinate for infectious bronchitis, which is a coronavirus, before 14 days of age, because in early stages, that virus can have an impact on the reproductive system. 
and cause problems later on in life. So in summary, uh, I hope you understand that we want to start with good be of birds, we want to feed them good feed, we want to make sure we give them more management, uniformity on body weight targets, and a proper photo simulation. I'll gladly take any questions. Okay, we Remember have this bullet okay. makes a great layer. Uh, we have some questions that came in. Um, from Pamela, for our backyard people who are limited due to city ordinance, what would you recommend as a minimum number of chicks to order? Some companies will only do 20 to 25, others will go as low as three. I try to tell people five to six minimum. Our feed stores are selling anywhere between three to five minimum purchase. purchase. What are your recommendations? Well, we don't have to make that decision here. We have a state law that says they can't be sold in groups of less than uh, six. I like to start out with a group of six to 10. Uh, and uh, somebody that's in the backyard, I think you may want to start out with more chicks than you plan on. Maybe double the amount that you want to keep and sell some of them to someone else that wants to start chicks or as a group decide to graze chicks together. But the six is probably a good number to start with. And you have to figure out what to hap what happens with any roosters that you get <laughs> if you're not allowed to keep roosters. Yes. Um, yeah, different states have different rules, so you have to watch out for that. Okay, so um, another question. Do you adjust the original pen they start in? Because you were talking about different square feet per chick as they get older. Or should you move them from pen to pen? Or will natural selection happen and you work with the numbers you have? Let's hope when natural selection doesn't happen. <laughs> uh, we, we, I would just give them excess space. And it doesn't mean that you have to be, the minimum is uh, half a square foot. If you give them two square feet, that's fine if they're young chicks. The more space, the, the way they get out of each other. The, way. Well, the, br the brooder guard would help for that the first part. The brooder guard helps to keep the birds in a smaller group. And then you just get rid of the brooder guard. Um, do, 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 do. Tony, do you have a feeding recommendation for mixed aged flocks? Uh, at different ages? Uh, What's available in the stores right now, you have a starter grower, you may have a developer at some places. Uh, again, the starter grower will be, uh, it's right in the middle. That is probably what I'd go with is a starter grower throughout the bird's life. Especially if you're dealing with laying birds, they're not gonna put on body weight to make it a de detrimental to them. Yeah, but I wouldn't have layers with non-layers. Well, no, you would not want to have mature birds. Mixing ages together causes problems, especially with uh, cannibalism and feather pecking. Yeah, you also have the calcium problem too, so. Oh, that's the other thing, especially if you have mixed sexes. We, uh, uh, that high layer diet with the uh, calcium uh, can cause problems in the male, if that's all they're getting, especially young males. Right. Um, Pamela says, I'm feeding a commercial layer with three plus percent calcium and I'm getting a lot of soft shelled eggs even from my one year old birds. I've added oyster shell free choice. Is there anything else I can do add? How long does it take for the calcium to build up in the bird's body before shells improve? And um, I had asked her a fo follow up question to clarify, and she said, yes, they are getting a little bit of scratch cracked corn. First, get rid of the scratch corn because it's like, I always consider scratch grains kind of like taking your kids to McDonald's for French fries. They taste really good, but they don't have a lot of nutrient value. But if you go with the oyster shell, uh, free choice, and the laying diet, you should be able to fix that problem getting rid of the dilution factor of the scratch grains and cracked It'll corn will help, help immensely. Help immensely. Uh, how should feed be stored and what is its shelf life? Uh, depends on what part of the country we're in. 
the biggest this particular thing, person lives in Florida. Okay. Uh, I would not go more than three to four weeks at most because with your temperatures that you have down here or down there, you can build up, have a uh, rancidity of the feet or breakdown of the vitamins. So and you should fresh, store it. And you should store it in a cool place, whether it's in a barn, but in a, a metal uh, contain a garbage container, things like that to keep the mice out of it. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to score it in the, the bags that you got, make sure you have bait stations around the feed, uh, especially between the feed and the wall to control rodents. Uh, we got a question here. How can, what can I use to help with black fly or gnats attacking my pullets and me? <laughs> Uh, there are some attractants uh, that you can uh, safely put out in containers that are above the animal, the birds, or what doesn't what doesn't uh, seem like new technology, but fly strips do still work. Yeah, um, they're not going to get. Are they going to get gnats? Do the the fly strips? Yeah, they'll run into them. Okay. Oops, I clicked off. Let me get back onto it here. Uh, we had other questions or messages at least. Um, excellent presentation, said David. Frame, thank you for the presentation. They have to run, was Brian. Um, is raising on floor what is the best kind of bed? If raising on floor, what is the best kind of bedding? The premium bedding is uh, dried wood shavings. Then as you go down, you you get different qualities. You, you can do uh, uh, rice hulls. You can do ground up corn cobs, things like that. An ideal bedding is one that absorbs the water, cushions the bird, and does not cause the bird to have uh that doesn't cause the bird to have any problems so and you it can, will release moisture too right so things like uh if you have to use a straw one inch straw if you have if you want to try to use uh you know we we use newspaper at one time but it has to be very small particles and it has a tendency to, uh, to slick over so i would say wood shavings Dried sawdust will be fine, uh, but if you get the wet stuff from a fresh mill, you'll have problems with it. And if you're doing wood shavings, it should be um, softwood, not hardwood, right? Well, the hardwoods is because of the tannins. If you have a open water system, like a bell system or a, draw, a trough or those gallon containers and sh shavings get in there, they can leach the tannins. But if you have a closed system, like a nipple system, it's not nearly the problem it once was. How often uh, would you need to change the bedding during the growing stages? Again, it depends on the ventilation and the climate. If you're having a very rainy season, we like to do it every uh, two weeks at all possible, taking out the wet spots. Right. Uh, how do you ventilate properly in hot climates. Again, this guy's from Florida. Uh, I would kind of make myself a tunnel ventilation. I would have some type of uh, large airflow through there. Uh, bring air in one end and bring it across the whole house and exit the other side of the house. Okay, and um, Joe Walter from Florida, their poultry specialist asked, has core Corrid been approved for use in laying hens? It is a approved drug for uh, laying hens. It has got one in there for replacement it pullets. Okay. Uh, it, I don't think it. David don't, Frame is on it. here. Maybe he has an answer. Oh, no, he left. No. No, he's still there. So, Corrid, you're saying, is approved for replacement pullets. Is, yeah. is it approved for laying hens? I don't know if it is or not. I can't remember if it is or not. I can't remember. David, you're on here. Um, do you know if it's approved for laying hens? 
you got other specialists on here. Craig Kufel from Texas is here and um, Ron Keen from Wisconsin. Nobody's typing an answer, so maybe they don't know either. <laughs> it has to be labeled. What you, whatever you use has to be labeled for that particular thing. So if you purchase it, you you know look at the label first, right? Mm -hmm. um, so even David doesn't know for sure. So his mind is blank. But um, you have to definitely check the, the label to make sure. Um, so Ron says it's Samprolium, which is approved. Not sure about the actual brand. Or rad, I think. Well, it would be Amprolium. Yeah, that's what he said. Amprolium's improved, but he's not sure. If so Ron's saying it's approved. Yeah. So, any other questions? We're over time here. Um, yes, always read the labels. Never give any medication to the birds. Especially laying hens. I think that's one of the things we got to remember is that there's a lot of metabolism going on in that bird. It takes anywhere from 10 to 14 days to form an egg, even though we know it only takes a day to build the outside of once an egg ovulates. But that yolk is being built over 14 days. So if you give a drug to a laying hen, you have residual um, drug uh, in that yolk for 14 days. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, Good presentation, Pamela says. So yes, it was very good. Thank you very much. Um, and as I said, this is recorded. It will be available on our um, on the learn page that you came in through. It will also be available as a link through our e extension page that um, I think I put the link to. I can't remember um, that has all the uh, articles, past webinars, what's coming up in future webinars, that sort of thing. So please uh, check us out. So thank you very much. Everybody stay safe and um, healthy. And uh, maybe we'll see you next month. Next month is 4-H uh, uh, related um, on some of the new things going on at National 4-H Poultry and Egg Conference. So I hope you join us then. If not, June is on processing chickens. Should be a very interesting uh, thing as well. So thank you very much. Everybody have a good day. Thanks, Tony. Thanks. Good job.